Okay, why don't we get started? So my name is uh, Sil Fai Leung. I'm the head and uh, professor of the economics department, and I'm uh, chairing this uh, session with three uh, uh, great uh, talks. Uh, so we had uh, 30 minutes each for each one of them. So we started late. So we'll uh, by six minutes. So we'll uh, keep on uh, uh, keeping the time. Okay. And so the the first one is uh, so the the session. For this session is on work and retirement. And our first speaker is uh, John Giles. And then so he would speak on a East Asia overview of work and retirement. And then um, okay, John. In, in some sense, this um, <coughs> presentation picks up where Thomas has left off. And so Thomas gave us some scenarios under which uh, increases of essentially the size of the labor force through encouraging people to work longer um, might plausibly mean that um, uh, reductions in growth with uh, a, a a growing old age dependency ratio may not be as significant. So what, what I'm going to do is to give you uh, patterns from micro data that look at uh, actual employment um, across several countries in East Asia. And um, what we're going to see briefly is that you can really think of two economies and two retirement systems in that for workers in the formal sector who have some type of access to a pension, uh, retirement occurs at, at relatively young ages. And we see an exit from the workforce that um, is, is, is relatively early. Uh, by contrast, workers who are still in the informal sector and often in rural areas work until much later. As, as one of our colleagues mentioned, they're constrained to work, and they may be working relatively low productivity and until they drop or until they're, they're no longer um, alive. So when we actually think about retirement and we actually think about leaving workforce, I think one of the issues around East Asia that countries are thinking about is not only on one hand, how do we how might we keep workers productive until later and maybe bring more women into the workforce or facilitate women's work at later ages, but there's also a social protection aspect of how to provide social insurance or social pension to provide some security in absence from, from poverty in old age. So both of these objectives are, are issues that are being faced at the same time. And as we'll see, to some extent, you might think that East Asia is ahead of, or has a, an advantage of moving later uh, if, if when we contrast it with Eastern Europe, where public pensions are very well developed and, and, and wide, there's widespread access to them. And this, this actually provides less wiggle room in, uh, for the policy folks in thinking about a design of, of new pensions. Um, so, right, so in thinking about well-being in old age, we, we, we want to understand the factors that are correlated with working at older age and recognizing that for some elderly, working into old age is a necessity and may actually have adverse effects on, on, on well-being at some point. Second, there are implications for pension systems um, and a, a trend that we see towards early retirement around the world that there is interest in, in trying to reverse, though is often um, fairly unpopular to do so if we try to directly sort of uh, in a brute force, in a, in a quick uh, manner, uh, raise retirement ages. So we want to understand factors contributing to earlier retirement, potentially to facilitate longer working lives. Um, it was, so we're going to look at patterns of labor supply across East Asia um, and across uh, the age distribution in different countries. Um, we've also looked at number of hours worked, um, conditional working across the age distribution. And I'm not going to pre present much uh, 
evidence on this, but we basically see very little left very little evidence of gradual withdrawal from the, the workforce. Workers tend to work until they're not working any longer. And so when we think about retirement, we want to distinguish administrative retirement versus economic retirement. Uh, economic retirement, we, by economic retirement, we mean actively working and engaging in income uh, earning activities, while administrative retirement would, would be uh, retiring and, cl and collecting a pension. So you could very uh, well, well, you could, you could have situations in which individuals administratively retire, start to collect a pension, and then return to work. They're not actually, uh, they haven't permanently exited from work. Um, we do see that exit from work is very strongly associated with formal retirement and ability to collect a pension. Um, and when we look across countries in East Asia, uh, differences in retirement patterns across countries <coughs> are strongly associated with formalization, uh, both of employment and pension systems. Um, uh, labor supply of um, East Asia's older workers, if you were to contrast evidence from HRS type surveys in East Asia with SHARE uh, in Europe, uh, labor supply of East Asia's older workers tend to be higher than in Europe. And again, this is associated with higher incidence of informal employment and self-employment and less uh, sort of less uh, access to formal pension support. Um, okay, so we're going to look at uh, in, in our descriptive evidence, the roles of pension eligibility, health status, and family needs. And one of the questions that we have uh, is related to our, our presentation earlier this morning is how family needs and the demands of women's, on women's time may contribute to a lower uh, labor force participation of women and whether um, so this would, would uh, you know, in, in searching for this evidence, we try to understand whether or not uh, some type of alternative long-term care uh, uh, system might actually facilitate work of women um, if women are exiting to perform non-market work. We look, again, across the region um, uh, from, we, one regularity that we observe is that urban residents are more, perhaps more affluent, have more savings, um, may have access to public pensions, tend to exit uh, work uh, or be less likely to be employed at, um, at any given age than their rural counterparts. And this, this actually continues to be true in uh, in Korea, after age 60, rural men continue to work longer than, um, than urban men, um, and urban, uh, rural women longer than, uh, longer than urban women. And we, we see this pattern um, in country after country in the region. We're sort of comparing across countries, um, one of the things that's striking is the very the relatively early retirement in urban areas of China uh, relative to other countries, with perhaps, perhaps the exception of, of um, urban women in Korea who are out of the labor force at, at even younger ages. The other, you know, of, and of particular interest for the bank in this report is the extent to which our, our East Asian colleagues are interested in uh, efforts at prolonging work life in Japan. And we actually see, you know, of the urban employees, we, uh, the J-STAR the, the suggests that men and women work at, are much more likely to be working at older ages than any of our other comparison countries in, in East Asia. When we turn to rural areas, and so again, I'm focusing on Charles, but the, we see a, a, a Charles, but also Vietnam, 
uh, Thailand, um, we see a much higher incidence of work at older ages uh, than in urban areas. And uh, this is associated in all likelihood with the necessity of continuing to work, and often in, in agriculture and fairly difficult jobs. So in one sense, the, work, the amount of work at older ages is far higher than is assumed in some of the standard demographic models, though there are important differences across countries and, and uh, considerable gender gaps and differences across urban and rural areas. There's a steep decline in labor force participation associated with the share of population that can claim some pension support. Um, we'll see that countries that show uh, countries that show countries where self-employment is more important tend to show less decline in employment at older ages. And then finally, Japan stands out as a country with more la labor force participation at older ages. So in thinking about skills and whether uh, more skilled individuals or people who are able to acquire skills might be able to work longer, um, in developing East Asia, we actually tend to see that individuals with more education uh, tend to retire or exit work, the workforce earlier. Now, there's a, a very good reason for this in that they tend to be the ones that have generous pensions and ability to retire. And so, you know, self-employment uh, is important for work at older ages um, and where older and less educated workers are constrained to work. If we were to contrast East Asia with ECA, or the East and Central, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, um, where pension systems have broader coverage, we actually see a reverse of the pattern. There's not as much of a, a difference across educational attainment in uh, disincentives to stay in the workforce. We actually see in Europe that more educated workers tend to be working uh, longer um, than less educated workers. And so this, this sort of suggests that if you are, uh, there's a higher return that you can earn in the labor force and there aren't a sort of unequal uh, incentives to exit, you may actually see people who can acquire skills staying in the workforce for longer. You know, I can reproduce a very similar graph uh, to this one uh, for um, China, but this shows that you know pension and other types of public support, unemployment insurance, disability insurance, uh, receipt is in the the share countries of the ECA region: Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Estonia, and Slovenia are very strongly associated with exits from the workforce. Um, in, similarly, if we were to look at China and add in uh, early retirement pensions, you see a very similar pattern with uh, women uh, exiting from work at even younger ages than we observe in, in Europe. So we've, we've run um, numerous uh, regression models, country by country, looking at labor supply decisions and thinking about um, you know, labor supply decisions being driven by a need for income, a capacity for work or health status, um, the opportunity costs of time, so uh, factors affecting the value of labor or time and alternative non-market uh, uses. Um, in urban areas, we might find that households are wealthier and many people have pension income at relatively young ages. In rural areas, households are poorer, few elderly have pension income. Um, labor supply may also be affected by one's own health status and capacity for work. Um, and this may be your own health or 
perhaps your spouse's health status. These can, uh, you know, so in, in, in running these descriptive regressions, we aren't ready to claim any kind of causality because, of course, uh, labor status, employment status may directly affect health or health may affect uh, your employment status and causality could work in, in either direction. Similarly, an ill spouse might lead to an added worker effect. Uh, in, if your spouse can't work, this may make it more likely that you work. Uh, alternatively, if you have to care for a spouse, this might lead to uh, an exit from, from work. And then there are also maybe different preferences. So across four countries, I'm just going to summarize what we've found. But the strongest correlate of exit from work is the ability to draw a pension. You know, so it really it, it swamps everything else in looking at correlations of employment. So it, it, it would suggest to us that, 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 that pensions are um, are uh, very, very important. We also had calculated z-scores of um, uh, difficulty or inability to, to uh, participate in activities of daily living or international, um, instrumental activities of daily living. These are significant. Um, you know, so a one standard deviation increase in an ADL or an IADL z-score leads to about a 5% reduction in the probability that you're employed. But, you know, when you bring this back to a policy question, we want to think about what, what would be the cost or what, how, do you, how do you implement a one standard deviation improvement in an activity of daily living. We don't, we don't have a, an answer for that, but it may, may perhaps be a, a, a tension to reducing hypertension or other factors that uh, contribute to stroke and, and disability. Um, we also find uh, some evidence that women's labor supply may be influenced by uh, the, the presence in the household or community of elderly parents or children, but this is actually much weaker than we expected to see. It's a, it's a relatively modest uh, influence on, on women's labor force participation and is not significant in all, all models in all countries. Um, we find evidence that spouses prefer to retire together, uh, so, uh, and, and this has implications for countries like China in which there are formal gaps in the legal retirement ages. So you can imagine that by effectively raising the retirement age of women, you may actually include their, encourage husbands to stay in the workforce for longer. And so at present, uh, white collar women retire at age 55, while uh, men retire at 60 and blue-collar women retire at age 50, though this is, being, this is being raised, as I understand it. Since the late 1990s, um, and one of the policies to encourage restructuring in China had allowed early retirement up to five years earlier. So this allows for and, and facilitates exit from the, the workforce at very young ages. Um, raising women's retire, uh, retirement age may, in fact, contribute to longer working lives as men as well. Um, when we look at, at hours of work conditional on working, we don't see a lot of evidence that retirement um, uh, is gradual. Okay, so in thinking about uh, this particular report, and also the, you know, in, in my conversations with the team working on the East and Central Asia report, there's, you know, sort of thinking about um, what factors might contribute to longer working lives for the formal sector workers. Um, 
you know, incentives embodied in pension schemes, schemes seem to be very important for influencing work incentives. Another question that keeps coming up are skills and the maintenance of skills and ability to work at older ages. And I think Bob is going to talk about this uh, in the next paper, but there's actually a, we found a dearth of literature on this topic and an ability to, to look at training and uh, sort of returns to train, returns to training and, and education of older workers um, in the literature. What we find suggests that the returns are quite low. Um, maybe training and adult education needs to occur much younger in people's lives in order to keep them in the workforce longer. Um, similarly, uh, we see that healthier men and women are more likely to be employed, but, but understanding the direction of causality is something that could still be helpful. For example, job loss may contribute to depression and deterioration of health. It, 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 in the, the cross sections that we observe, uh, there, we, we can't necessarily ascribe causality here. Then finally, there's weak evidence that women's care and women's work uh, and care responsibilities in the house is affecting, um, is affecting uh, decisions to exit the workforce. So I want to mention one case study in, in looking at the effect of introducing a pension in rural China, um, Chuan Chuan Zhang at Beijing University did his, his dissertation in effect of evaluating uh, the China's new rural pension program, which extended a very low social pension to uh, rural elderly over age 60. You know, the motivation for this in the wake of the, the global financial crisis was you know, concern over both direct and indirect shocks to income, desire to promote higher domestic consumption, and in fact, in light of the, the, the fact that there are two retirement systems in China, there was a notion of, of, of trying to narrow, you know, use this as one step towards narrowing the gap in benefits between urban and rural areas, and to, to raise the security and, and reduce risk in old age, of old age poverty for rural residents. So there are other potential beneficial economic effects. Reducing income risk in, uh, may have increased efficiency in, in labor use and land reallocation. It may have facilitated a structural shift out of agriculture. Um, you know, if a, if a secure source of income made elderly more willing to transfer land and perhaps to more productive uses. It may also be more willing to, to for for them and for adult children to move out of agriculture. Further, it might later facilitate even migration of elderly uh, with their children to the cities. Now, the, the actual work that we did used uh, two analytical approaches. Um, the preferred one used a regression discontinuity design that exploited the age of eligibility to receive a basic pension to look at a number of different outcomes and decisions uh, after uh, availability of the pension. Um, this was, we did this using the, the China Health and Retirement Survey, which is famous to people in this room. Um, uh, the actual subsample used in the RD uh, design was based on those rural communities where the NRPP was implemented at the time of the survey. And, and you know, what we found was that there's a very low pension, right? So it, essentially it ended up working very well as a, an anti-policy program for the elderly without distorting a lot of other decisions. And to some extent, you know, so Chuan uh, Chuan's paper suggests that it reduces the incidence of household poverty. Um, there may be, you know, over somewhat wider uh, bounds around the retirement age, there's some evidence that it may have increased uh, retirement or in reduced uh, labor supply 
an improved subjective well-being of the elderly, but there's no impact on migration of adult children, no impact on a, a lot of other uh, household, effect, household outcomes apart from the elderly's income and, and some expenditure effects. The own income effects we found were somewhat higher for individuals in poorer health who may have been less likely to be able to work. Um, and again, the, the relatively modest effects suggest that the outcome um, on, on outcomes reflects the fact that the pension was very low. Um, and you know, to some extent, this reflects a, a, perhaps an effort to proceed very, very slowly. And that I don't think one has to worry that the, NR, the new rural pension program is creating outrageous disincentives to work while it is providing poverty support um, for uh, older rural residents. Okay. That is what I have for you. I think okay, next thank you. Uh, we have about uh, seven minutes for questions and discussions. And the, the Eastern Europe, Central Asia experience as well, there's, I would imagine there are a lot of company type towns where the unemployment pension or disability pension substitutes for really a long-term unemployment insurance. Comment. So in terms of like rural, rural area, uh, old age, labor supply decision, maybe you already mentioned this, but I think it's interesting to look at how the migrating workers, you know, the fact of this old aging problem, uh, labor supply problem, and it's related with structural change, as you mentioned, and also urbanization, right? So when a lot of young migrating workers leave their hometown, that somehow like force the, their par old parents to work. And maybe at a certain stage, when regional inequality becomes less serious, then the migrant workers come back, that might, you know, like lower their labor supply of old age, you know. And so we actually have, we, I've actually done some work on this question okay. with, um, with Yao Hui Zhao and, uh, and uh, Jun Jie Guo, who's a graduate student at University of Wisconsin. And, you know, so it's, we're, we're, we're working on adding additional instruments for migration, but in general, there are two effects, and that remittances tend to be fairly high from migrant children. So there is an income effect that actually can, could, can facilitate reduced work among left behind parents. We expected the sort of model in our head in our minds was that, okay, parents want the option value on land, so they'll have to keep land productive, so they'll have to keep working in agriculture. And, you know, teasing out, you know, whether it, and under what conditions and what heterogeneous circumstances you see a decline in, in work associated with migration and where uh, you see an increase is not, it's, it's not immediately straightforward. We basically find a wash once you control for the endogeneity of migration. It looks like zero, but we're exploring the sort of heterogeneity in that. Which country are you? Uh, this is in China. China. Okay. Uh, actually, I found uh, there are a very strong impact on the migration of young people from rural area. A very strong impact on retirement rate uh, in Korea, uh, uh -huh. 1980 to 2000. Interesting. And you have a paper on this. I would like to cite it. So, I was uh, wondering about the uh, the institutional constraints on on labor supply. So, a lot of times, pension availability goes with mandatory retirement. Right. right. And then hours worked. Well, there's a lot of rigidities in formal employment about hours worked. And so I, w I was wondering about both of those things, whether you found that the hours worked, uh, is that very more with age in informal employment than in formal employment? And is there some way to distinguish the pension availability from uh, the existence of mandatory retirement? Um, so depending on how long you've contributed, you could become eligible before the mandatory 
retirement age. Well, if you're a worker, if you're a farmer, you don't right. have access to a pension, <coughs> and you can work as long as you want. That's right. If There's you're no, a government worker, you have a public pension, and you have to leave at age. Right, you have to leave your government job. But in none of these countries does that mean you cannot re-enter the workforce in other types of activities. So, you know, there is a, Duncan Thomas had had a student that um, had looked at civil servants jumping, when civil servants decided to jump rationally into their next career. You know, so would they take in, in um, and this, this was in Indonesia. Um, I've, I believe I've read some work in the Korea literature as well that suggests that uh, there's, a, you know, there's a timing decision of when people who face mandatory retirement in the civil service will choose to move to a less formal or less constrained job. Um, but yes, I mean, that, that has costs associated with it. And not everyone wants to make that move or is able to. Last question. Sorry, we we, we run out of time. Sorry. Sure. Uh, the lady. Lena. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, actually, my question is a, a perfect continuation to what you just said. Uh, how well do we understand the labor demand supply, uh, the, the labor demand side of of the decisions of the older worker, to, uh, older workers to remain employed? I mean, I I I following the U.S. literature a little bit, and there is a lively discussion there. But I wonder how much uh, do we know about these issues in in East Asia? I would like to turn this over to my colleagues here because this is something we we do need to know more about. My sense of the literature is we don't know that much. Um, perhaps in the, the Japan literature, there's more um, more information on this. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So we'll turn to our the next uh, speaker.